I'm now going to talk about hernias because they are a very common problem, although often very poorly understood by undergraduates and often examined. So what is a hernia? This is important to be able to rattle off in a viva scenario. It is the protrusion of a viscous or part of a viscous through a defect in the wall that retains it. There are three basic physical signs of a hernia swelling. They tend to occur at a weak spot and in hernias that are not complicated they have a cough impulse and are reducible. There are some important anatomical terms to consider when describing a hernia. These include the sac which consists of the fundus, the body and the neck. Please note on this diagram that the wall of the hernia from inside to out consists of peritoneum, subcutaneous fat and skin only. If there was fascia in the wall of the sac this would not be a true hernia in the case of divarication of the rectus. Also to be considered are the contents of the hernia which generally tend to be bowel, which would give a gurgly feeling when examining it, and a mentum, which is described as a doughy feeling. Next to be considered is the anatomical site of herniation. There are several very common sites and many much rarer sites. The common sites include inguinal hernias, femoral hernias, umbilical and paraumbilical hernias, incisional hernias, which technically isn't a standard site, and epigastric hernias. Rarer hernias include spigalian hernia, which classically occurs below the arcuate line in the linear semilunaris. Other hernias include lumbar hernias at the back and obturator and gluteal hernias. The next way of classifying a hernia is by its pathological type. Most hernias are reducible. This means they can be easily poked back in. However, the next stage up the pathological ladder is an irreducible hernia where the hernia cannot be reduced. This is also known as incarcerated and may be due to a narrow neck or adhesions between the hernial contents and the sac. If a hernia containing bowel is irreducible it has a high risk of becoming obstructed and therefore the patient was present with abdominal distension, vomiting and absolute constipation. An incarcerated hernia is also at risk of strangulation. This is when the blood supply is compromised to whatever is in the hernia, so the patient may or may not be in obstruction according to what is in the hernial sac. For the sake of completeness, I should also mention that some hernias can simply become inflamed. This rather busy slide is to just show you that there are several other types of hernia. You can have a rolling or sliding hernia. Most hernias are rolling, whereas the most common form of a sliding hernia is a hiatus hernia, although, as you can see from the diagram, this also comes in the rolling form. Richter's hernia, on the left, is when only part of the intestinal lumen is included in the hernia. This means if it is incarcerated or strangulated, clinically, patient still would not be obstructed. Madel's hernia on the right is a type of hernia where there is a W loop of intestine in the sac and it is the loop of intestine within the abdomen which strangulates so it causes a very strange clinical picture. Now because inguinal hernias are the most common hernias it's really important to have a good understanding of the inguinal region. It's really important to be able to locate the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle medially 
with the inguinal ligament suspended between the two. Remember also that there are some vessels to remember about and the pubic symphysis in the midline also. Remembering the arrangement of the neurovascular bundle emerging from underneath the inguinal ligament isn't that difficult either. As long as you remember that the artery is located at the mid inguinal point which is halfway between the pubic symphysis and the anterior superior iliac spine. You can then work out the position of the other vessels with the mnemonic navy, nerve, artery, vein, then y fronts. With the skin and some of the anterior wall of the inguinal canal taken away, please just note the transversalis fascia with its deep ring, the internal oblique forming the deep ring and the superficial ring, and the external oblique forming the superficial ring only. Now it's worth remembering here that the deep inguinal ring is located halfway along the inguinal ligament. So this is the midpoint of the inguinal ligament which is subtly different to the mid inguinal point which is where the artery is and it's halfway between the pubic symphysis and the anterior iliac spine. Let's first of all discuss the most common type of hernia, the inguinal hernia, which can come in two types, direct or indirect inguinal hernia. Of the two types of inguinal hernia, it is the indirect inguinal hernia which is the most common. This is because it follows the normal path of the contents of the inguinal canal, which in the male is the spermatic cord and in the female is the round ligament. As you can see from the diagram, an indirect inguinal hernia first goes through the deep inguinal ring, traverses the inguinal canal and then comes out through the superficial inguinal ring where it is palpated. Conversely, a direct inguinal hernia emerges straight through a weak posterior wall of the inguinal canal into the superficial ring. Remember that the weak posterior wall is formed by the transversalis fascia. The femoral hernia is a different kettle of fish altogether. While the inguinal hernia is more common in males, a femoral hernia is more common in females and is actually at a higher risk of strangulation. This is because it has a very narrow, quite rigid neck formed medially by the lacuna ligament, anteriorly by the inguinal ligament laterally by the femoral vein and posteriorly by the pectineal ligament. The femoral hernia actually protrudes into the femoral canal and the space is present to allow for expansion of the femoral vein. This space is naturally bigger in females with the gynecoid pelvis. Finally note on this diagram that the femoral hernia emerges lateral and inferior to the pubic tubercle, whereas the inguinal hernia emerges superior and medial to the pubic tubercle. Finally, onto the points that we need to elicit in taking a history of a hernia. It is very much like taking a history of any swelling, in that we need to establish the onset, course and duration, whether it's painful or painless, and if it is painful, we want to know about the Socrates of pain and then we want to know if there are any other lumps that are past or present and if they are the same or different. We want to know the effect of the hernia on their general condition, especially asking about signs of bowel obstruction such as episodes of vomiting or constipation. We also want to establish a cause for the hernia. Have they had a chronic cough? Do they have COPD? Are they constipated? Do they have any symptoms of urinary obstruction? These are all causes for high intra-abdominal pressure. We also want to know if the lump disappears or not. This gives us an idea of whether it is at risk of strangulating and obstructing. Now on to examination. As in the history, it's actually quite simple and is very much like 
at any examination of a swelling, but there are a few other rules that we should stand by. The patient should be standing, unless of course it's a very obvious hernia, um, it could be examined lying down, but don't forget we need to examine the contralateral side, and to definitely exclude a hernia, the patient should always be standing. With the patient standing, we should stand on the same side as the hernia and ask the patient to cough, first of all observing and then feeling for the cough impulse. And then we should examine as for any other swelling. You should also try and reduce the hernia, commenting on the direction in which it reduces and the contents. We should then try and identify a cause for the hernia by examining the abdomen, performing a digital rectal examination and also assessing the external genitalia to ensure there are no other complications of an inguinal hernia. I just want to take a quick step back to ensure that you take the systematic approach to examining a hernia that I described in examining a swelling. We should start with inspection, which now consists of eight S's, which are sight, size, shape, symmetry, surface, skin overlying, scars and special signs, which is probably, in this scenario, the cough impulse. This could also be demonstrated by simply asking the patient to lift their head or their legs off the bed and observing for any protrusion. You should actually get into the routine of doing this for every abdominal examination while you are inspecting. Note that on inspection the site of the hernia can only be stated approximately. For instance, you may say there is a hernia in the groin and it is not until palpation that we can assess where exactly. On palpation, we're looking to elicit any tenderness, temperature. If you can get above the swelling, this is particularly important in uh, scrotal swellings because if you can get above it, it indicates it may not be a hernia, but if you can't get above it, then it may well be an inguinoscrotal hernia. Comment also on the surface, edge and consistency. Remember that when we're referring to consistency, we talk about if it's doughy or gurgly. And then we need to explain the relation of the hernia to the surrounding structures. Also don't forget to examine the regional lymph nodes and elicit any special signs such as cough impulse, juiceability, and perhaps transillumination. Now as the inguinal hernia is so common we should really talk a bit more about the surrounding structures of the inguinal hernia. I know we've already discussed this point but if you take one thing home about inguinal anatomy remember that femoral hernias emerge from lateral and inferior to the pubic tubercle and inguinal hernias emerge superior and medial to the pubic tubercle, as on this diagram. Now we've already mentioned the special signs of cough impulse and reducibility, but we haven't mentioned the internal ring test. This is actually a very insensitive test, but is often examined because it demonstrates an understanding of the anatomy. First of all, the inguinal hernia should be fully reduced and the finger placed over the deep inguinal ring, which is located at the midpoint of the inguinal ligament, halfway between the pubic tubercle and the anterior superior iliac spine. The patient is then asked to cough or strain, and we inspect for recurrence of the hernia through the superficial ring. If there is a recurrence, then we assume that this is a direct hernia, because otherwise we would be stopping it at the deep ring. It follows then that if the hernia does not recur, we assume that it is an indirect hernia because we are stopping its protrusion through the deep ring. Finally, I think it's important to consider the differential diagnosis of a groin lump. I advocate using a surgical sieve because it keeps your answers in a logical order and stops you forgetting any important things. So any lump could first of all arise from skin, such as a herbaceous cyst, or fat, such as a lipoma. It could also arise from muscle, such as a sarcoma, or it could be an abscess in this area, or any of the other two that I've already mentioned. 
It could also arise from an artery, such as an aneurysm, or a vein, such as a varix, and then, for completeness, it could even arise from the femoral nerve, such as a neuroma. However, to give you a list of the important things to think about in a groin lump, we should think about inguinal hernias, femoral hernias, enlarged lymph nodes, topic testis, femoral aneurysm, or saphena varix. Now to summarise your findings and examination, you can simply define the hernia anatomically, then pathologically, and finally stating whether it is recurrent or not. For example, I may summarise a case by saying, this gentleman has a right-sided unilateral indirect inguinal hernia that is reducible and recurrent. Note that by recurrent I do mean it has recurred after previous surgery. Well done, you've come to the end of this section. I hope you found it helpful. Please don't hesitate to see my website memorablemedicine.com for any further information.